the paradigm. And like, and it was amazing because all these things that I was praying in my home, separate, maybe never even to see her again. Like the Lord was working and shifting her heart, and it was just pretty awesome, amazing. And there's more fantastic details that, as they unfold, I will share. Um, but it's a Saturday night, and I know our plans are going to be even smaller on a Saturday night. But um, so again, just getting to that place where where we're putting in the time in our prayer. You know what I mean? Like it's the thing that shifts the atmosphere. It's the thing that changes people's lives. And you may not always hear about it. Like I might not have. She might have been like, I don't want to reach out to the girl. She's going to think I'm crazy because we only met one. But she she did, and I got to see immediately the impact of it. But sometimes we don't. So it's just it's more of that encouraging, exciting thing that like he the entire kingdom is shifted by our time of prayer. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and the faces are so daunting when I look at them. They're like. Good luck, Matt. <laughs> You're very tired looking. It's very good. Um, <coughs> you good? Yeah, we're good. All right. Um, okay, let's get started. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so I asked everybody to reach Genesis chapters 2 and 3. Give me a quick raise of hands if you did that. It's all I wanted for my birthday. <laughs> Come on, guys. It's once a year I have a birthday with <laughs> If you didn't read it this week, I'm sure you heard the idea of it in the past. It's where we cover, um, we move past the, the, the seven-day creation. It's the end of the seven-day creation cycle, and it's the, the story of, more of the story of um, Adam being created, and then Eve being created, and their, their partnership with God, and then chapter 3 goes into their, their um, transgression from that covenant, their, that, that breaking of his trust, that falling away, and what happened next. Um, uh, we have some visitors, so let me go back and give some context. We, we felt like in, the, um, in this season that we've been coming into for quite a while, it's not just a new year uh, calendar thing, it's just like a new season of humanity that, that um, God was going to, he is awakening his children all over the earth um, and that, that cry to like God has been hearing her cries that God, there's got to be more. There's got to be more than just going to church and being quiet for 45 minutes and, and moving on. Um, there's got to be more to this empty, lonely life that we call Christian existence, in, in, at least in America. And, and, and I believe that God has been engineering and, and, and pushing his children who would hear his voice and respond to it to, to respond in a very simple manner of, it's not about this big show. It's not about this big thing. It's about this, this, this simple union with God where he is our father and we are his children. And, that he, and if he's a father and we're children and we're, we only can truly show our love for him by the love we have for one another. And if that is really how he set us up according to his word. Yeah. And if that is really how <coughs> the New Testament church started with them going from house to house. Um, keeping the apostles' doctrine, keeping the prayers, breaking bread with one another from house to house, living with gladness and simplicity of heart, it says. Um, if that's how this whole new covenant church started, then why did we ever deviate from the plan? Yeah. I'm four years into a potluck every Sunday because I believe in breaking bread. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Um, this is not just a, a, a pass by the night idea. This is something I've been, God's been leading us in for a while, but I do feel like this shift is happening where I'm starting to hear it all over the country, different places, different people, some famous people, I'm seeing them shifting their ministries towards more like family orientation. Um, and with that, we started a couple weeks ago on Genesis 1, and we just began to open our hands and our, our understanding of God and scripture and what he was to us, what he was in the scriptures. And we asked the question, would he be angry with us as his children if we believed he was better than he actually was? Is that even possible? Could we let go of our possible misunderstandings, misconceptions of who he was to us, what he did through us, for us, to us? Could we let go of all that believing that God, as a great communicator as he is, could um, convey to our hearts the true definition of his love for us um would we get it absolutely right i don't know nobody's gotten it absolutely right yet but could we get closer i dare to believe yeah. 
I dare to believe that we could um, open our minds and our hearts and let go of anything that we thought of him, even if it was right. If it's right, he'll probably bring it back around, right? Yeah. But if it's wrong, he might replace it with something better. Yeah. And I have believed for a long, long time that God is so confident in his goodness, in his power, in his hand, in his ability to communicate to his children that he was okay with us constantly wrestling with these ideas. In fact, the, um, the notion that there is a singular truth and that a, a, a living, breathing Western evangelical could grab a hold to this singular truth and know the truth and everybody else would be wrong, that's a very modern Western idea. Um, before this modern Western thinking crept into Christianity, we had Eastern thinking, which was very much like scriptures are organic and they're alive and well. And that God told timeless stories in the Bible and that we would read them and understand truths of human nature with God beyond just historical accounts. And that they were meant to be tossed back and forth and wrestled with back and forth. And this was not questioning God. This was challenging man's understanding of God, yeah. which is how we got all the way to here. That's good. But Western evangelicalism has grown somewhat stagnant because we decided that the only way to truly know God was to have the absolute authority on his truth. And all that created was what? Divisions. Divisions and divisions and divisions and divisions. And I just have a hard time believing that that is God because he seems to be love and love seems to be unifying, not dividing. Yeah. Now, there are some truths that are closer than others. There's no denying that. I don't want to act like everybody's right all the time, right? <laughs> but God didn't say you would know me. I would know they will know that you know me by the how right you are. Right. He said, "You'll know they'll know you by the love you have for one another." Yeah. Yes, yeah. and so we began to wrestle with these scriptures, and then we read um, chapter one, and we said that everything he created, God sat back and studied it, and said, "That's good. Yeah, yeah. that's good." And we and we challenged the notion that we carry um, as modern people that that hell was at the center of the earth. Um, where the exact geographical location of this place we call hell is somewhat irrelevant to this conversation. But the fact that we picture it at the center of earth makes us think that hell and the devil and the enemy and loss and, the, and all of that is at the center of our sheer existence. Mm. And that the heartbeat of everything would come out eventually, right? So we think that it's in the center of everything, so we look for the center of everything. And we, we predict the demise of everything because we've been trained by, I'm going to say, not God, to see hell in the middle of everything. Yeah. Even our eschatology of, of how God would save the world, somehow hell crept in and became the major player. Come on. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. That's another story for another day. Amen? <laughs> We're still in chapter 2 and 3 of Genesis. We'll get, we'll get to the end later. <laughs> Albeit, the end looks strikingly similar to the beginning if you read revelation 21 to 22 just read what the city what the world's going to look like at the end of all of this human existence show i don't even know that that's the end that's the end of the struggle to get to the end i would say revelation 22 if you read it closely sounds alarmingly close to genesis 1 through 3 yeah yeah, yeah. yeah very good so as we read Genesis 2 and 3, if you read it ahead of time, great. Whether you read it ahead of time or not, I'm going to ask you to go back and reread it tomorrow morning while we're not having church. <laughs> what I did today, and I feel like this was the Lord inspired me to do this, um, so please bear with me and have mercy if, and, and, and don't be alarmed. I rewrote Genesis 2 and 3 from a first-person perspective. Um, let me give some context. When you read Genesis, have you ever thought or had someone ask you, who was there to tell the story? There's nobody alive yet. Yet it's told, this story is written down and told of God creating this, and this is before humans even existed. God did this, and God did that, and humans show up, and, and it's this third-person storytelling, yet no human exists. Well, if you, don't, um, if you don't know where these books came from, we believe, many, many, most all people believe, that um, God gave 
the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, um, to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now that topic alone, very interesting, worthy of an hour plus long discussion yeah. of um, what that would look like. Any, any good idea is worth wrestling with like everything else we just said, and that's okay. But the, the general debate comes down to, did God just download the first five books to him in one quick shot and then he went on and wrote them down? Or did he gradually reveal them to him as time marched on? Interesting subject because, not what we're here to talk about today, but interesting subject because it includes not only his missteps that he would have to be um, dealt with harshly for, but it also includes his death and what happens afterwards. A lot, that's a whole lot to gather, whether you got it at one shot or collectively over time. Yeah. But Moses knew before and after his existence. That's a lot of weight for humans to bear. Yeah. And even though Genesis, um, these first chapters of Genesis, which are uber important to your existence, um, this was the original idea that God gave to his people to understand the heart of him and humanity. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. And so it's, while I don't want to take away from Holy Scripture, I don't want to add to Holy Scripture. What we're going to read tonight, not Holy Scripture. This is taking great liberties to dare to imagine that God was better than we thought. Okay? Yeah. Yes, don't be alarmed. <laughs> yeah, we're basically saying anybody who's never heard this yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all good. I always read from Scripture. <laughs> always, always read lots and lots of Scripture. But tonight we're going to read this, and I want you to just hear it with open hands. This is not Holy Divine Scripture, but this is just a pendulum swing, if you will, away from this obtuse, angry, unpredictable God is ah, always looking to strike us down. This is a pendulum swing in the far other direction. And maybe with that, it'll awaken something in you to reread Scripture and say, God, have I missed something altogether? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So I wrote this in the context of God telling Moses on Mount Sinai. Yeah? yeah. yeah. My wife's going to get a microphone. She's going to read the part of Moses. That's going to die very soon, so I'll put this one here for okay. you. Oh, look at that. Um, again, when Moses goes to Mount Sinai, the people saw thunder, earthquakes, fire. Anything that came on the mountain would have been consumed. Um, you can sit down. What's up? Oh. Would have been consumed. Come back here. Big and scary <laughs> and all, you know, and all that. Um, this is written more like once Moses was in the cloud, it was a much more peaceful <coughs> place. Um, again, oh, just read. It's good. It'll make sense it's when you hear. It's good. Mm -hmm. It'll make sense. Can we start? Yes, Moses. How did we get here? Why are we here? You mean, why are we on this mountain? No, how did your chosen people get here, enslaved for 400 years and surrounded by evil? This was never my intention. I could not have worked harder to set my people up for success. One day my people will finally arrive at the glory that I intended for them to always be in. If you go back to where I began the human race, you can easily see I never intended for this. If the whole world thinks you did this to us, if you are saying you did not, why have you not defended yourself? Everything they need to see me clearly is right in front of them. They have to be willing to take that journey to get there on their own or else it would be worthless. When I created the world, I put all of my being into the creative works of my hands. Every single thing has a touch of my DNA in it so that my heart is expressed in every single thing for the whole world to know who I am. I went through a painstaking process to design a system that would constantly reproduce itself, manage itself, make itself more and more beautiful as the years go on. When I finally got to creating man, my true offspring, I took the most time creating him. I meticulously formed him out of the dust of the earth. Why the dust? Oh, I wanted him to be formed from the earth so that he was completely connected to it, at least the body side of him. Since my intention was for him to rule and reign the earth and all of creation mm -hmm. on it, I needed him to be connected to it so he could feel and have compassion for the thing he was in charge of, just like I'm connected to the things I've created in spirit. When I saw that the man I had formed from dust was a beautiful creation, 
I breathed my Holy Spirit breath of life into his nostrils. I gave him a spirit that would keep him connected to me and drive him in the right direction. And like any proud papa, as soon as I saw him, my heart was connected and leapt for joy. Then I immediately went to work planting a beautiful garden that would be completely self-sustaining and yield it to his authority. I thought it would be hard for him to come up with this on his own, but if I created it for him, he could easily follow the model. He had all the freedom in the world to maintain the garden, expand the garden, eventually grow it until it covered the earth. I only gave him one very simple instruction. You cannot eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or else you will certainly die. Then why did you even put it in there? Well, that's a little more complicated, but in a nutshell, for the garden, for the earth to have all that it needs, it has to have a balance of things that aren't for humans to interact with. Like the tree of life needs to cross-pollinate with other trees, such as the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to function. However, humans were never supposed to have that awareness. They were simply supposed to live in a world where those things were working properly without their involvement. I loved him so much that... The way, he was, uh, the way he was so much like me, and at the same time completely his own man. I even gathered all the animals that I had created, only one by one brought them to him to see what his heart would name them, to hear his perception of these animals. My heart was so full of joy watching my firstborn son begin to function like me. I realized at some point that he would need a partner in life for companionship, for procreation, to be able to share the love in his heart with. Instead of forming a whole new creature from the dust, I took his rib and created a woman. This is why they weren't simply the same species, but they were from the same bones, the same DNA. They were two and one at the same time. The same union happens when the children of God are getting married today. This is why I told them to leave their mothers and fathers, who they were originally one with, but when they joined the Holy Union with their spouses, I grafted them together as one bone. I'm beginning to understand. In the early years of that union, it was so fun to watch. They would work together, and I would meet them in the garden, and I would, uh, we would all talk and walk and discuss life, watching them grow together, watching them rule the earth and tend the garden in the way I intended my heart was full. They were so happy and innocent that they weren't even aware that they were naked. The thought that anything or anybody would misuse their nakedness had never crossed their innocent minds. Is not modesty from you? It is from me in this fallen world that is full of lust. In this depraved world that fallen man has created, how could you ever be a good example if you weren't properly clothed and everyone's mind was going somewhere else the entire time you were with them? But again, it wasn't my intention. I desired innocence over modesty. But when the serpent decided to leave Eve astray, everything changed. Did the serpent choose Eve because she was the weak link? Oh, absolutely not. Looking back, I made it abundantly clear to Adam not to eat that tree. He had conveyed that message to Eve, but had failed to convey the seriousness of the situation. It would have been much harder for the serpent to get Adam to take that first step of wrong, and Adam should have been better at leading his family, much less joining in that misstep. But that's for another day. None of that matters now. What matters is as soon as they ate the fruit of good and evil, the weight of that revelation crushed their spirit. The revelation that there was a world of hosts around them, both good and evil, was too much for them to bear. They immediately forgot who I was to them, immediately began to hide from me as if I had done this to them. I showed up to walk with them in the garden and they were no longer there. I called out, Adam, where are you? Show yourself to me now, son. Finally, he made himself known. He was ashamed that he was naked. He didn't even want me to see him, forgetting that I formed him from the dust, forgetting that I could only be good to him because I loved him. My heart was truly broken, knowing that because of the shift in their awareness of evil, that there would be natural consequences that had to take place. What does this mean, natural consequences? I believed you were angry at them for, following, for failing the test of obedience. Um, disappointed in them, yes. Anger-inspired <coughs> retribution, no. 
But I form the world in a particular manner, and the natural consequences have to run their course. You see, I created men to be innocent and under my hand of protection. As long as they will do their part and stay innocent, I can do mine of providing the hedge of protection. But as long as man decides to remain the judge of good and evil, I cannot properly protect them, nor can they function as the rulers and reigners of this world. I wasn't angrily proclaiming a curse over them. I was simply, lovingly telling them what to expect. I tried so hard to protect them from this fate. I even continued to work with their children, desperately trying to correct the course of humanity every step of the way. If your desire was to correct the course, why place them out of the garden? Could you not protect them better in the garden? It was ultimately for their own good. Just like any parent who has children that are of age making bad decisions, the only true act of love at that point is to put them out so they don't get stuck in the state. You see, if they were now aware of good and evil, the next temptation would be to become judges of good and evil. Once you appoint yourself a judge in your mind, then you begin to think you are a god in your own mind. Once that happens, you begin to make all your own rules and then instantly begin to think that you are the best thing on earth. And why wouldn't the best thing on earth want to eat the tree of life and live forever, eternally stuck in a broken state? I could not bear to see the rest of this fall, so I stopped the bleeding by putting them out and locked the door. It was my only hope that one day my children could come back and then eat the tree of life and live forever. Then it is still an option to return? Of course it is. I never change. My original intention will never will finally come to pass. The earth will be completely covered in my glory. Evil will be done away with. The heart of man will be governed by my Holy Spirit in them. Well, can we just do that now? Ah, not now. Mankind has deviated so far from the course, it's not a simple return to the garden. We have to correct the course of humanity and slowly get it back there. One day it will happen, but until then, live your life and do your part that I give you to play, and you will be in the kingdom with the rest of us. You know, before they left, I even took time to make them proper clothes before I put them out. Their leaf idea, albeit simple, was not a good long-term plan. I could not bear to see them brave the outside world in fig pants on, so I just wanted to do what I could see them succeed even if they were in a state of failure. On the day that God put Adam and Eve out of the garden, we read this as if he's a angry God who desires obedience, blind obedience over anything else. When I believe we could read this section of chapter with compassion in our heart for a father who lost his firstborn children. I believe that as I began to read this, these scriptures with open hands, that this is what the Lord put on my heart. He showed me his heart in these events. Mm -hmm. And that he suffered this great loss. And then albeit it was hard to make these steps of correction. And it was in, in being a all-knowing, omnipotent God. He knew that this would be a long trip around the mountain before he yeah. could get us to Revelation 22. Yeah. But it was the only thing that could work at that time. Yes. And he suffered a great loss. And since then, the human race has done him the favor of heaping insult to injury for 6,000 years. Yes. We've made him out to be this awful God. Now, maybe I painted him too nice in this picture. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he's been painted too awful in this picture all these years. And we haven't taken time to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, as Jesus said even a decent earthly father gives his kids good stuff yeah. right yeah. why would he as the ultimate loving father be so hard to deal with to be with right. we're going to keep reading eventually we're going to get to the next chapters where he's coming and he's walking and talking with the children of Adam and Eve mm -hmm. he's catching Cain before he makes his great mistakes and says hey man that thing we talked yeah. about, sin, it's, it's knocking on your door. Yeah. And you're letting pride eat you alive. And, it's, and it would be really, really good for you to humble yourself right now and get that under control. 
least you eat the fruit and die. Yeah. We're going to come back another day. We're going to talk about how this, this story of Adam and Eve eating the fruit is, an, is a greater lesson that we were all supposed to live by all the time. How often we eat the fruit of our fallen friends. But today we're going to talk about just the goodness of God. And can we dare to read scripture, all scripture, and see his heart in it? 20 years ago when I started reading the Bible, I wanted him to be good. I wanted him to be good. And I said, God, I, I want to know your scripture. I want to understand the spiritual realm. And I want to see that you're good. I believe in my heart you're good. He's better than I thought he was then. But I believe then he was good. And I said, I want to read your scripture. And I want you to show me how you're good. And I read the Old Testament for the, the first years of my Bible study. I really focused mainly on um, some of the letters to the churches. And then the Old Testament stories of devastation. Colossal overthrows and, and slavery and blood and guts. And even God's judgment <coughs> on the people. And how he would decimate the people at times. And, and, and you know what? That is where I found out that he is always good. It's a larger topic of how you get to how those moments are his goodness. But it's, it's his heart for humanity. He does some of the hardest, worst things that he ever imagined he would have to do to protect the bigger picture of getting humanity from this fall in chapter 3 to Revelation 22. Yeah. And he will stop at nothing to get us there. Yeah. Yes? So we live this life daring to believe that God is just that good and that we can read scripture. And maybe, maybe this rewrite of Genesis 2 and 3 doesn't get me in uh, the greatest theologians books of the, of the 21st century. <laughs> but I have dared to believe that God was that good and he has yet to let me down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has met me in ways that I never imagined he would he has saved me from things i never imagined was even possible for god to interact with humans in such a manner i've seen him cut so good in so many occasions i've seen him do things for people who wanted nothing to do for him mm -hmm. nothing to do with him i was certain they would want nothing to do with him after he saved them and i told him that <laughs> and he still saved them <laughs> that's how good he really is and we don't think he's as good as we are by the way we read scripture. Right. But we read these scriptures with open hands, open hearts, believing that you probably can't get it so wrong if you're leaning on that side of things. Yeah? Even if you go in the real harsh, like he's a really mean, angry, hellfire and brimstone God. Well, that even kind of works a little bit. But it only goes so far. You can only scare people into heaven for so long. Because eventually, if you're scaring people into heaven, what happens when they figure out that he also has an attribute called mercy? Yeah? What if that mercy is what allows us to believe that he's this good and that our lives were meant to be more than um, admission payments to heaven, that our lives were meant to be partnerships with him on this earth? Uh, believing that this kingdom of heaven would come to earth. And that statement alone has gotten me in a lot of um, controversial conversations over the years. But I just ask you to go read the New Testament. Yeah. yeah. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. <laughs> Repent. It's here. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is now within you. Yeah. It, there's this passage, Revelation 22, it's, it covers the whole thing, right? I feel like it's right in there. Yeah, there's a few things in the middle you can, you can wrestle over the words with, but yeah. The garden was supposed to expand. Eventually, Revelation 22, we get there. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Now, for those of you who watch the news way, way too much and have been taught to see the world through man's perverted eyes, you might say, well, looks like the mission's failed, Matt. We got a lot going wrong, wrong here. Right. I mean, if you've heard me do this before, we'll do it quick. 2,000 years ago, Jesus resurrected from a tomb. Our true Savior overcome the sting of death, resurrected, getting ready to ascend to the throne to be our ultimate authority, our high judge, our high authority, our big brother. He resurrected to one woman crying at a dead man's tomb. Yes? Yeah. Within 40 days, we had a handful of people on fire with the Holy Spirit, 
Within after that, we had thousands, just thousands, coming to him, going through great persecution and still growing slowly and slowly. This is still very much a Jerusalem thing. Uh, um, over the next 30, 40 years, it'll expand slowly into the Gentile country. Yeah? yeah. 2,000 years later, people tell me a plan hasn't worked. But Christianity is the dominant religion in the world, and we're on seven continents. Mm -hmm. Even continents where people were persecuted largely, they're, they're, stopped. they're not even hiding anymore. Mm -hmm. You won't see it on the news much, but one of the greatest revivals on the earth is in the Middle East. Yeah. Now I know that's not what we're taught to see. Yep, that's true. But let me ask you this. If eating the fruit awakened an awareness of evil, if that awareness of evil was what led to the ultimate derailing of God's plan for our life, then why do we think studying what's wrong with this world and the evil in it yeah. and the bad news and the bad news and the, oh, it's going to snow, by the way, and bad news... <laughs> Why do we think that's going to save us? Why do we think that is going to get us back? Could you dare to believe that you could abandon your awareness of evil and that God would protect you? Yeah. I've gone for, I mean, I probably know more about the news now than ever, um, which is not much. I just kind of know like basic weather and basic laws and stuff. But um, I went for years and didn't didn't even know it existed. What can wouldn't even walk in a store that had it on in the background. I had no concept of what was going on. God would tell me to pray for certain things, and I would, and that was all I needed to know. I was good. And you know what everybody told me? You can't live like that, man. You just can't live like that. What if, what if something happens? You won't even know. <laughs> you know how long people have thought that way? You know how long the sky's been falling? How long people have been creating bunkers and storing up 57 years worth of chicken noodle soup? <laughs> you know how long? Don't make fun of us. Though. What if we're... Yeah, sorry. That hits my close to my um, What if we are the generation that the whole world collapses on? What amount of preparation is going to stop that? Let's just live our lives and be happy. Let's put our heads down and love Jesus. Love the world around us. I'll be honest with you. As far as evangelism is concerned, it's a whole lot easier to be nice to your neighbors if you don't know them on Facebook. <laughs> it's God's own truth. So I hope taking these liberties has encouraged people or at least awakened this idea that you could read Scripture in a different context where everything about God wasn't harsh and mean and ugly. Yes, there are some moments... Or if you went straight to them right now, it would be hard to see his goodness in the singular story. The bigger picture tells the whole story. Yeah. There's never a time where he wiped out a people where he didn't yes. lose a many of prophets warning them to yes. repent or else the kingdom's going to come get you. Other than that, I just say, let's read scripture. Mm -hmm. I hope the liberties I took didn't alarm anybody. If it did, go talk to Jesus. I'm sure he'll tell you that I'm still a decent dude. Um, Good man. Or even go read the scriptures. Read the scriptures. Yeah, go read yeah. the scriptures and you won't be offended yeah. at all. Yeah. Like the way, uh, there's a little more to it. Um, reading it in the first person of God telling it. He's telling the story of creating man. Have you ever noticed that he, he formed the woman and he said, and says, I told them to leave their mothers and fathers and join you. Well, that seems weird. They don't have, he is their father. Yeah. Some of this stuff, it sounds weird until you take into account that it's thousands of years later. He's telling Abraham, he's telling Moses what happened. Right. And the marriage and the unions has already taken place. And he's explaining why this thing. So all, read it in that first person. Read it. Read it. All your scriptures like that. Um, that's something that the, the Mark said the Lord put that on his heart as he read Isaiah. To read the proclamations of Isaiah from first person from God. Start to read scriptures as if it's live, as if it's God speaking to his people and speaking to you. Yeah. Find your place in the book. Find his heart in the book. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. He will not let you down. And not knowing what's going on in the world, in the news, doesn't actually change your life nearly as much as you think it would. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Jesus, we thank you so much for what you have done we thank you, Lord, for the liberties you have given us to read your word and to know you. Some of the greatest Christians I've ever known could barely read. 
but your Holy Spirit led them to your goodness. Your Spirit showed them of your hand in this world, and they dared to believe that you would love them too. So as people who can study your word, I just ask you, Lord, to release the, the chains of bondage that intellectual assent has put on us and made us fearful of making mistakes of knowing who you are. Where we want the grace to, to put all that on the line in an attempt to actually know you as a father, to actually know you as a God in our hearts, to actually know that you're real. We thank you, Lord, as we take this time and this space with you, that we no longer have obligatory offerings of our 15-minute readings in the morning. But we have our time with our Father. Yes. A time with you, Lord, where you could minister to our hearts, set our hearts in a direction for the day, give us things to think about, to talk to you about, to see you in. And I release right now, as you have said, this new anointing in this season to know you. For those who would humble themselves and give their hearts and their lives and their decisions their yeses to you, Lord, that you would begin to speak to them. I see people as they're going through their days and their chores, as they're cutting off the noise of the world, the radios, the talk shows, the news, that you, you begin to put ideas and thoughts in their minds. And I ask you, Lord, to give them grace to believe that it's you, to follow your voice, to follow your instructions. It might not be grand. It might not be a big revelation for the world to know. It might just be a simple instruction to be kind in the moment. And by faith we hear this word. By faith we live by this word. By faith we are your children. We love you, Father. We thank you for this beautiful life thank you for the opportunity to dare to believe yes. that you are better than we can imagine. Yes. In your name, Lord, we pray. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody needs